Today, we're going to be talking about the power and essence of self-love for those of you that live with multiple sclerosis and how connecting deeply with self-love brings healing. I'm Jen Tracy, and this is the Women Thriving with MS YouTube channel. I invite you to subscribe below. And before I introduce our guest today, I want to tell you about this exciting new podcast series that I'm creating with YouTube. And this is the first episode. It's called Leading Change for MS. And it's a series that features inspiring people who share their insights and experiences on how to manage and heal multiple sclerosis from the inside out. Mm -hmm. And today I'd like to introduce a lovely and amazing human being, Menina Buna Ali. Menina was a mathematician who was completely asleep in her essence. And that is the way that this mystery called the universe unfolded. Then an MS came and woke her up completely, destroying her life and turning her world inside out. And in this, she found the worst wrapped gift, wink, wink, ever, mm -hmm. herself. So today I'd just like to, oh, one other thing about Munina before I, I just give her the hurrah here. Munina is the author of the book, Receiving the Healing Gift of MS. I just want to show that on the screen so people can see that. So welcome, Munina. It's such a pleasure to have you here today. I'm so excited and thrilled to have you join us. Hi, Dan. I'm so happy to be here with you. You're so sweet. Thank you. You're most welcome. So I wanted to start off. I'm living with MS and writing a book. You know, that's a big deal. And I'm just really curious about what inspired you to write this book, the Receiving the Gift of Healing in MS. Well, it's very simple. The day that I realized realized that MS was not what everybody says it is. And I decided I had to say something. I had to take a stand to share this information with people. I had to write about it. I had to say something, take a stand. Yes, and when I read your book, I noticed that it really is a, a compilation of years <laughs> Mm -hmm. of learning and knowledge, um, just all the training that you've had since you've gone through this journey. And we'll go back to that in, you know, we'll go back to the beginning in a few minutes. But um, like just how many, uh, how many different trainings you took and workshops and retreats and everything to, to help you. And I'm, I'm just curious, how, how did you... Uh, get started in that what was the beginning before like after the diagnosis and, and all of that when you said i'm going to write this book were you writing for years before you published like what was what was that um path for you okay i was diagnosed in 20, 2007 and the idea to write a book came in 2014 so that's seven, seven years yeah. Seven years. So that's a long period. Period. Yes. From there, it took me four years to write the book. Right. Well, four years to just wanting and wanting to actually do it. Yes. Ah, wow. So that's a real, a real level of tenacity to have that idea in your head in in uh, 2007. Yeah, in my heart, for sure. In your heart, yeah, in your heart. Yeah. Thank you. No. And and then actually, then then starting to do it, and then the journey of actually doing it. Yeah. Yeah. So today the theme is is around self love and self love and healing. I think uh, this says it all. We yeah. can just stop there. The essence of healing. Yeah. Yeah. And of love also. Yes. I think, yeah. So just to give people that are watching this video or listening to the podcast some context, let's go back to that time. Let's go back to that part of your life, 2007. And if you're willing to start there and tell us uh, about your journey with being diagnosed with MS. Yes, it happened very drastically, very, very rapidly, suddenly. 
before that, I was living all in my head. I was very powerful in my head. But I was cut, it, cut from here, meaning I was cut away, cut from my heart, which is terrible. <laughs> I thought love was weak. Ah, so describe that. Let's go back to even before 2007. So there yeah. you were in your life. Uh, fill, it, fill me in a little bit and, and, the, and people uh, that are, are watching this. What, what, was the, what was your life like just on a day-to-day -day basis? What were you up to? I was working full time, pretty normal life, you know, very busy with life, and, but cut away from my heart. That is the, the biggest cue that something was wrong. Mm -hmm. Yes, so no emotions and consequence of no heart, no emotions. All of them, good, bad, whatever, none so whatsoever. So I was busy a whole rainbow there. Yes. Yeah. Was it? Was there a sense of numbness in your life at that yes. time? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I was fever numbing myself. I was. That doesn't relate to a mess, but I was mm -hmm. numbing myself. Yeah. I didn't want to feel nothing. Yeah. So yeah. And I just out of curiosity, if you're willing, and only if you're willing. Would you say that that roots back to um, even family of origin of that place of numbing? Like just, you uh, know, in terms of your upbringing? I'm just curious. We've never really talked about that. I know. I, so yes. I don't. <laughs> I would say yes. I, I would say I, I wasn't brought up to feel. I was brought up to think. Yeah. Yeah. So when you hit that turning point in, in 2007, where were you when, you when this rapid change happened? What, what came about for you? I was away from home, family. And then very, very suddenly, in a few hours, my body paralyzed the whole left side. The left side? Yeah. OK. So when you say paralyzed, um, completely. Completely. Yeah. So you couldn't see out of one eye? No, I could see back on blink. You couldn't blink? No. Could you move your head? Yeah, but I couldn't move my left side, like my it's all, lip, okay. my eyelid, right. my, my arms, obviously, every, yeah. Yeah. everything. My son probably was uh, not so yeah. mobile, you know? Okay, and, and, and so there you were in that state, and, and what did you do? I mean, this is like, you must have been feeling some panic. Or something, right? What were you yeah, feeling? Sure. But also, it was also so overwhelming. Like, mm -hmm. that I kind of like, is it just too much for me to look panic? Or it was just too much. I was like, in awe. Like, what the fuck? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. But it was yeah. Like, say it. Say it. It's, it's all it good. Like, like, <laughs> come on. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't like, yeah, it was very obvious. It was drastic. Yeah. Drastic. Yeah. So I was at, the, my family brought me to the hospital and the doctors diagnosed me very quickly with MS. They passed me the MRI, the lumbar puncture. Yeah, lumbar puncture. So when you say very quickly. A few hours. Uh, pardon? A few hours. Really? Okay, yeah. so very fast. That's, yeah. that, you know, that's very abnormal, right? I know, I know. A lot of people, I know they, they can wait years and they don't know what ha was happening to them. I know, but that was not my case. Yeah, it, and it's interesting because I had left side stuff too uh, on my left side of my body and it probably was, uh, and I was diagnosed in about uh, 24 hours. So, uh, you know, I guess that's, that is a very clear path. So there you were, you were diagnosed and then what happened? Uh, there you were, you had a left side paralyzed. How long did that, were you in that state like that for physically? A few weeks, it was like completely paralyzed and then with the drugs and the physical therapy mm -hmm. slowly started to come back to life right and what were you what were what was going on for you in your heart and your mind at that time like was there denial were you uh you know yeah you sure the denial, denial came full circle soon but yeah. when i was in the beginning i thought to myself this is no surprise because I had been so unhappy for years. I was very unhappy in my life. I, I lived a normal life. I was working, making a lot of money, friends, boyfriend. I had everything, you know? Yeah. But I was very unhappy because I was so disconnected from myself, my heart. So I was not happy. 
you know, I was missing me. So that, uh, I think, yeah, there, I think there's no happiness without me. <laughs> Even though the money is there, friends, boyfriend, no, it has to come for me first. But I was missing see me, so I was very unhappy. Yeah. So for, for me, right on the spot, I said, oh, baby, this is normal because I was so unhappy. So this is like only the normal result of me being so unhappy, but like not a little bit, like a lot, like deeply. Yeah. Yeah. So you were able to recognize, you were able to ask yourself that question back at that time. Yeah. But then uh, I forgot about that. And yeah, I started to deny. Oh no, no, denial. Denial kicked in. Right. (laughs) Wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So that that aha moment, and then just the back to the normal suppression and numbness yeah. of yeah. life. Yeah, yeah. But you were able to get back to work part time after six months. It was pretty quickly mm-hmm. during whatever I had been through. I think. Yeah. But I went back part time. Started to numb again myself. Just started to continue my life without changing nothing, usual, being, being the usual unhappy me, let's say. So when was the next, um, so you just did that, and how long did you do that for before? Three years, Three years I was not. And, and then? I, I worked mm-hmm. hard, Jen, really, because, yeah. So you had another relapse, though, right? Yeah. And it was another big, like, we're talking like tsunami, yeah. not just like a little, like a little uh, er, again, tremor, you know? Yes, tsunami again, yes, exactly, you're right. Mm-hmm. And so you were able to teach yourself the first time how to physically walk and do what you needed to do again. You had to learn to speak and walk, right? Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. So I just want to acknowledge that before we move on to 2010, because, you know, even if you were in that place of unhappy, you obviously had a part of you that was determined. Oh, yeah. Like to, to get back to that baseline of normal, right? Absolutely. Yeah, and I worked very hard, like you said, to walk, to learn to talk, to try to work. Yes, yeah, the, 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 the normal life, normal. Right. Yeah. So in you, though, that, that dedication and determination was so alive, even if the emotional part was, like, still dead, right? Yeah. yeah. And what, just out of curiosity, what do you attribute, I know this is, may seem like a strange question, but what do you attribute that determination that you had, even if the denial was like totally pressing you down, that, that got you to not give up and, and, and um, you know, go into that place of victimhood, like why me? What, what, what did you have that was able, even at that time, to push you back up to, to, to overcome? I mean, that's a huge commitment that you made to yourself. That's a very good question. I'm not sure I know. So, okay, well, let's, let's fast forward to 2010 then. You had another relapse. Was it worse than the first one? I would say it was because this time, not only my body was affected a lot, but also my mind. For me, that was terrible because I was all about my mind. So I was like, oh, I'm nothing now. I'm no one. So that was hard, very, very hard for me to have a cognitive damage. Yeah. Yes, yeah, like a brain damage, right, basically? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. cognitive, yeah. Because it's yeah. Not all brain damage, but this one is cognitive, yeah. Right, now it's like what you had valued about yourself mentally yeah. the most yeah. was now being robbed from you, yeah. right? Yeah. And I could not work anymore. <gasps> so that was horrible. Years to get over that, really, because I was all about my mind. Come on. So, yeah, that was really, took me years. And, and just so people in the audience know, and, and honestly, like, I don't even know if I know, when you say cognitive, what was it that happened that made that, you, you know, I, I mean, I hear about brain fog, and I know what that's like to have fatigue and have brain fog. So what cognitively happened? Do you, are you aware of what what was different that time round? Well, I just couldn't, couldn't, could not work. I could not remember, remember my knowledge that I could, I would, I would use to work back then. Mm-hmm. I could not work. I could not sit down at the door. There was nothing happening. I could not, just don't do it. I could not do it. So I, had, I passed some tests with the psychologist, mm-hmm. psychologist, and yeah, no, I could not work. Yeah, the, the test. 
So what changed for you at that point when that happened? There you are, you're probably in total crisis, right? You've oh, lost who you think that, that you are in the world. Yeah, that was worse than the first time because yeah. me, I was totally identified with my world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was, yeah. It's, it's who you that saw is. yourself as being in the world, right? Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. So how did you, maybe starting from the beginning there, uh, so what were the thoughts that were coming to you? You could no longer be in denial, I imagine, at this point, right? No, no. no. Obviously, my life was gone. Hmm. That's how you saw it at the time. Well, yeah, it, yeah, exactly. It was. I could not work. <laughs> what, then, what Then what? So how did you, you know, you had to obviously do the same thing to rebuild your body, right? To be able to walk and talk. So you had to learn to walk and talk a second time. Yeah. And we just acknowledge here in this video that uh, English is not your first language. French is, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, the fact that you are doing, you know, number one, speaking so well and also speaking English, just want to commend you on that, right? Um, so what did you, you know, how did you, what was the first thought you had that was leaning you towards, okay, this is, this has to change. Like, I can't. I can't uh, operate the same way anymore. Well, first of all, it was just a plain uh, cost of noticing that this can never be the same. My life is never going to be what it was. And with that, did that come sadness or was there joy or grief? Like what was it? What was uh, associated with that? Sure. Anger, madness, me, ma- anger, anger. Mm-hmm. yeah. Sartre, yeah. In your book, actually, you talk about one of the, the, in the chapter on love, which is the 14th chapter, which is, is, you know, kind of what we're basing this on. Again, the book here, uh, Receiving the Healing Gift in MS by Munina Huna Ali. And uh, you talk about something that's just such an amazing story about you were working with a phys- physiotherapist. And uh, you want to just tell uh, about the mirror story uh, from the beginning so people can hear. Yes, thank you. This is a great story, life-changing story. I was learning to walk again with the physiotherapist. And we were walking in a very small room. And there were mirrors all over the, this room. And she suggested that I should look at myself and smile. I was like, yeah, right. No, what am I going to smile about? I don't want to see me. So I was, but she was very nice. So I said, okay, fine. I'm going to try it. So I tried that. There was a revelation. I certainly did not want to do that. Look at myself, me? No. Smile? No. So this kind of opened the door for me to have a different relation with me. So it, it kind of it, it introduced me. This I can continue. I continue this work. This is a lifetime work to befriend my image, to look at me, to love me, to see how beautiful I am, to yeah, this is me. I can look at me now, but I could not back then. This was a stranger. I don't, I don't want to say stranger. Now it's, it's me. <laughs> it's very different. And this work is very powerful. Maybe you know about her, Louise Hay. She's, she's a very renowned, amazing, amazing grand woman. Really, she, like, she touched the world, the world. She was really a grand woman. Yeah, she had the book, You Can Heal Your Life. Yes, yeah. and she introduced the world to mirror work. work. You guys want to know more about this work? Yeah, let's, let's talk a little bit about mirror work, because it sounds like you were introduced to it from the physiotherapist. You yeah. maybe had some insights into Louise Hay's work even before yeah. uh, you did. Yeah. I'm just yeah. curious about no, that. Exactly. I was introduced to the work with the physiotherapist and I heard about this mirror work from Louise Hay years after that. Mm. So I thought, okay, there's some basis for this work. 
the idea of sitting, you can, I can do this sometimes at home, at home, I sit down and I look at myself in the mirror. I can talk to myself, I can, Louise Hay has, of course, a whole practice that she offers to people. I never did her practice, but the, the main the idea, you can start practicing right now. Just yeah. when you walk in front of a mirror, look at yourself. It's you. So just look at you in the eyes and see how beautiful you are, even though you could be all messed up, whatever, waking up or whatever, just to see yourself. And you could practice this in the morning, whenever you walk in front of a mirror, whenever. You know, we go shopping, there are mirrors everywhere. Just to say to yourself how amazing you are. You know, you just some clothes on. Oh, I look good, you know, just to be to be your best friend, to just love your image. It's you. Practice now when you see a mirror. When we see one at least in the morning or every time we work brush our teeth or you know, we see them. So we can yes. start now with no no help from no one. Just we can begin where we are now, where we are now. And see the reaction it brings up in us, in us, you know. Yeah. So just as people are are hearing what you're saying, um, that idea of embracing yourself, uh, whether it be it could be like you said, looking into your own eyes, and it's like those kind words that you would you know that you long to hear. Maybe you have longed to hear in your life from others that you yeah. can you can give those to yourself. You can yeah. you can do it like. It could be, um, uh, there's a, a woman named Sarah Payton, she talks about, it calls it your resonant self, you know, so it's like you're talking to, but you don't, it doesn't have to be you. If it's too uncomfortable to be you, you could imagine like a beloved grandmother or a pet, you know, uh, saying that to you, right? Initially, if you, if it's too hard in the beginning to uh, to say it to yourself, you could imagine that you're hearing it from someone who you love deeply saying it to you, but you're looking at yourself like, oh, you know, I just, um, whatever that thing is that you want to say, like, uh, what, what beautiful eyes you have. I know that you have, I'm just making this up, what beautiful eyes you have, Jen, you know, you're, you're, you're either deep, like your soul, you know, something, it can be anything, right? Absolutely. And when I know I remember doing this, let's say sitting in front of the mirror for a few minutes, crying the whole time, my life out, just crying, like saying this to myself and crying, like, you love me? Wow, wow, crying is good, crying is cleansing, it's opening up the heart, it's perfect. Yeah, you cannot do this without being touched. So it's a good exercise, I think. So in the beginning, it was hard for you to look in the mirror and oh, yeah. recognize, like, who is this person? <laughs> What's going on? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This yeah. person has brought me to the hospital. I don't want to see her. No. So no, it was hard. Yeah. Yeah. But it's the best idea, I think, ever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is. So people can get information about this uh, by searching for Louise Hay, and eventually maybe you'll write a book about it. <laughs> no, I know. No, she's done an amazing job. No need for me to write about it. Okay. Need for me to do it, but no need for me to write about right. it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you had a, a commitment to yourself to do the mirror work, even though in the beginning it was hard. Was there a point where you noticed, like where you could look at yourself in the mirror and you noticed a shift? Right, you felt it in your heart and in your soul. No, and it was not a commitment either. Just, it was just a a new idea for me to look at me, to be framed with me. Mm -hmm. What an outrageous idea! <laughs> yeah. yeah. 2010. I mean, that's yeah. 10 years ago now. Wow. Wow. Yeah, you're right. You know, or wow. you know, what else would you like to say about self love? Uh, you know, this is such a rich and, and deep talk topic. I mean, we could be talking about it for a long time, but just in terms of, of people, you know, really longing to connect more deeply with themselves and, you know, and heal the, you know, as we talk about healing from the inside out, Okay, 
First of all, self-love is a never-ending story. It's something I, I continue to deepen every day for the rest of my life. Yes, first of all. Also, what I want to say is is discovering, discovering that we are miracles. So the more I realize that I am a miracle, the more I can love myself. And how, how do you imagine, um, you know, for some people hearing that, uh, oh, I can never see myself as a miracle. I'm broken. I'm, I, I, you know, I, I have no bladder control. I have brain fog. Uh, my life is, is ruined. Again, where would be maybe a starting place? Uh, you know, we talked about the mirror work. What else can, can people do living with MS when they're really longing to have change, but they're, you know, it's, they're in a painful place? Yes. Also, I think what really helps is uh, getting information, educating oneself. For all of you, I would really recommend, it's an amazing video that you could find on YouTube. It's a song actually called The Miracle, The Miracle Is You. The Miracle Is You. It's Maybe a, I can include that somewhere. Um, miracle yeah. Is. It's an amazing song, like two minutes. Uh huh. And it, it shows you in this short amount of time that we are miracles. So educating ourselves about who we are really helps mm -hmm. us to deepen this relation that we, have, we can have with ourselves. But it's a growing relation. Yeah. And when you say that, it's really interesting, Munina, because the, um, just like in your story, it really resonated with me when you're like, well, who, you know, who am I now, right? After, you know, being diagnosed and, and having that, uh, your thinking brain being impacted. Um, you know, I was at the peak of my career, um, making the most money I'd made, and I was doing what I loved to do. And I thought I'd never be able to work again. And I was like, I didn't know who I was. And I think that's um, common for people with a critical illness or diagnosis of MS to come to that place of, oh my God, like, who am I now? Uh, I think there's stats out there, although I'm kind of talking out of my ass here a bit, but uh, <laughs> that a lot of people are like, uh, that have MS or A-type personalities. They've been like, you know, they were really go-getters and, <clears throat> and determined. And so then there's that rug being pulled out. And, but we know like, uh, underneath all of that, um, as human beings, we are more than our career or life or money, as you've talked about. And, and who we are, the essence of who we are, isn't what we do. Exactly. But that, for me, it was all that I knew. And maybe you answer your question. Maybe I was a type A. You're ah. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, how do we take that? Well, you know, I was I was in a place where I wanted to. I thought I'd, if I can't ever work again, I don't want to be alive. I even read an article about a woman who um, she was diagnosed with uh, Parkinson's and she had a baby, and she knew you know what might possibly what her journey might be, and she had fantasies of dying of cancer and. Um, you know, I read that article and I thought, I knew I wasn't dying, but I felt like I was dying inside, you know, I, it wasn't logical, but I felt I really was having a death, which I was, right? I was, I was, uh, I was grieving the person that I used to be, just like you have sp uh, spoken about, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think we need to acknowledge here to people that, you know, it, oh, yeah. it, you're either, either you, you've been there or you're in it and you're stuck in it. And, but the truth is that you are more than what you used to be. And, and there's nothing wrong with um, recognizing that your life is different, but it doesn't have to be uh, lesser than, 
right? Exactly, yeah. And so when we talk about identifying who you are now, it's about going, it's, it's like going like 10 notches deeper, you know, or something, right? Yes. Yeah. A version, a version of me died. So it's okay to grieve for her. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes I still, I still do when it, get, it comes up. I grieve. I can cry. So, oh, uh, you deserve to be like that. And I can cry. It's okay to grieve for the, this part of me that died. Then I can also celebrate a new part of me that is, can, can be born also. Yeah. I, I, I'm changing. Yeah. Yes. I, I love how you, you say that, Munina, because I think we need, uh, it's important for people to have the space not to suppress those emotions. Oh, exactly. Right? Is to allow them to be there. But, uh, but to, when we're stuck in it, then we can't really celebrate the, the new me or even find out who that new me is because oh. we're too stuck in the place so yes. allowing those emotions to be there to cry and 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 uh acknowledge it and over time i can say from myself my own personal experience and i imagine maybe you can comment on this too is that you know my neurologist told me it would take about it's possible that i'd have three years of major grief before i would have a shift and ironically that was the case maybe you know mm -hmm. and uh like you i do have times at times where i grieve maybe when I have like the odd setback or something or just something hard in my life. But I think um, uh, it does for, it can get easier. First of all, even if you don't do the deep work, it can still get easier. <laughs> but when you do, when you focus on self love and self care uh, and you have, have put time into that um, as opposed to putting all that energy into feeling uh hopeless, that's when the new you becomes born, right? It, it starts to um, emerge. Yeah, it's important that we take the time to grieve, to process the loss. We have our set time to be born, to birth something, to something new. I think it comes naturally. Yeah, I think it's, it's good not to rush it. This I'm speaking to myself because I'm, I'm really, I really want to rush through my life. I'm learning now to just relax. Just, just this weekend, I was at the workshop and the woman said to us, we were, we were lying down and she said, okay, now relax, relax. Oh, she said it twice. I love that. This is good for me. This resonates because as a Taipei, I guess, I really, I really need to learn to relax deeply. This is for me, I think it's a life lesson <laughs> to relax. <laughs> yeah, I'm learning this today. Imagine it's 2020. So it's, yeah, so this is a, it's a journey, it's a life journey too. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And so, when you look back, so it is 10 years later and you're learning every day. Yeah, yeah, think, 12 years even. 12, yeah, longer, right? Yeah. yeah. So what do you think though, when you look back at that old you back then and this, this you of where you are today, what do you think is the biggest um, transformation that you have experienced as part of, of this journey so far called life? The biggest transformation? I could sum it up in saying that I discovered me because of the disease. Yeah. And me includes so many aspects that I didn't, did not know. But I'm learning always, I will do this all, all my life, to get to know me. So today, yeah. So what about someone who would say to you, yeah, you did it, but I, I don't know. I don't think I can. It. It's not finished. I am doing it. Uh -huh. Sorry. Just to... 
Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, you didn't. Yeah, you're 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 not you're not done. You're doing oh, it. It's, yeah. It's uh it's an ongoing. Yeah. 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 So let's say someone is you know they're physically impaired and they can't do what they used to. They could be in a wheelchair. Uh, they might need a mobility device to get around. Um, they've got progression happening. And, but they, they, there's a part of them that's longing for something, some change. Um, where, where else could they get started in that? What, what would be like one step that they could do to, to start to find who they are now? Like just the beginning of that, scratching that surface. Well, first of all, if you have a longing, it's amazing. A longing. I think it all starts with the longing for something else, something more. That means we have the willingness to, for something more. Longing, I love this word. Mm -hmm. I think it starts with there, with that. Yeah. So when, when someone can recognize that there is that longing, they, they, yeah. they want something more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then what? to nurture it, to, to feed it, mm -hmm. to give it more life, to see where it leads you. Mm -hmm. Where does the longing wants to take you? Yeah. So no matter what physical state a person's in, their mind and their heart can take them somewhere. Yeah, you can have an idea for what to do. Yeah. yeah. And what if someone doesn't have that idea? How could they use self-love as a way to nurture themselves just to even calm their nervous system, you know, to just bring them to a place where they can feel, uh, instead of being in that place of fight or flight, you know, ongoing, to actually just have that, you know, be in a place where they can even just take, like you said, with the mirror, it was just even a couple of minutes. Like, you know, what else... Uh, could they do self-love wise that could just be a few minutes just to take them away from that you know that that gerbil wheel of of thinking of yes now you mentioned a very important point i think it's very important that we activate the parasympathetic nervous system and we turn down off the part of flight response the Turn, turn it down, yes. Down, yeah. 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 So that's one thing to say it, but, but yes. what would be like something that someone could do in the beginning? There are so many ways, depending on your temperament, how you are, who you are. Mm -hmm. So many ways. I list a whole set of ideas in my book. Uh, interesting. And just as you said that, you know, uh, the sun must have come out because your your environment just got brighter. Like, ah. <laughs> no, no, it's serious. This is so important. Yeah. Because I think the the rule of, of any disease is stress. So we really all need to turn it down. Okay. So for me, way that I do that. Mm -hmm. Of course, or not of course, but what's important that I learned that I continue to deepen. I began my year, 20, 12 years later, putting being at the top of my list of things that I want to do. Be. For me, it means meditate daily. Mm -hmm. So this is a, an awesome way to cultivate being, just to be. Mm -hmm. Nothing to do, nothing to say, just to be. I think this is a great way to cultivate being to learn to relax. But apart from that, there are so many ways. Let me name you a few then. I love to take a bath. Mm -hmm. Something that you find relaxing could be petting your, your pet. Could be cooking, could be doing some art, could be going for a walk, could be spending big time in nature, talking to a friend. Could be so many things. Could be uh, making love if you have a lover. 
spending time, quality time reading, anything that makes you relax. Right, yes. To really cultivate this relaxed state of being. Yeah. Like I said, um, this here still and, and will always be at the top of my list. Yeah. But this is one thing that I learned as, as an ex type A. Uh -huh. I was all about doing. Uh -huh. I don't know nothing about being. What do you be? Right. No, I want to do. No. Yeah. No. First is being relaxed. Uh -huh. Breathe. <laughs> Breathe, yes. Yeah, even just a breath exercise, right? Yeah. Even Breathing, just absolutely, yes. five minutes or two minutes or one minute yeah. of just yeah. pausing, breathing. Yeah. Doing exercise, doing yoga, doing mm -hmm. whatever brings you joy, basically. Mm -hmm. There's no one way, there is your way only. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I learned an exercise through the coaching training that I took where you just breathe in through your nose for five counts, breathe out through your mouth and do that a few times and then put your hands on your heart and continue to do that and think about someone that you appreciate or something you feel grateful for and just getting into that, you know, that real heart place. Exactly. This is an, another amazing way that you bring up, Jen. Thank you. This is awesome. Practicing heart brain coherence to mm -hmm. activate the heart to bring your awareness down to your heart and mm -hmm. this is very relaxing this is very good it's a breathing exercise like you say it's a activation of emotions heart felt emotions and also it gives you access to your intuition mm -hmm. so, so this is amazing if you go on YouTube, there are plenty of exercises that you can learn this practice. This is very powerful. So you called the practice, what do you call it again? Heart Brain Coherence. Heart Brain Coherence. Yeah. To harmonize okay. the brain with the heart. Very powerful. Bring your attention down to your heart instead okay. of being stuck here, yeah. bring it down. Cool. And when you're down here, now the ideas from your intuition intuition come can come to you for what mm -hmm. it is that you really want what it is that your soul wants yes what can you do to relax what can you do with your life ideas are going to come to you from not from your reasoning mind but from your heart mind from your soul so this is awesome that you mentioned it this gen good job Thank you. And, and just going back again to the theme of self-love before we come to a, a natural conclusion for today, Munina, um, you know, I think back to um, in a time where I was housebound and I had ended a relationship because I felt I could only take care of myself and my aging dog and not deal with another partner or person in my life. Um, I started to uh, what I call date myself, you know, like I bought myself flowers and I put them, I put them in a place where I could see them. And then I'd be like, Oh, those are so beautiful. And that's like for me and, you know, um, take myself out for something to eat or, um, you know, like he was talking about some of these relaxation things, reading a book or something. I, I, when I, when I had really, really bad vertigo and I couldn't even, uh, leave the house, I would just listen to audio books, you know, audio books that were kind of like, um, almost like theater with different characters. And, and, you know, I think there's so many little ways that we can um, show love and care for ourselves. It doesn't need necessarily money. It just requires uh, a commitment of a little bit of time, starting small uh, in those ways of love and the, the, the mirror exercise and the breathing to the heart can, can, be, um, can be these tools. So I just want to ask you before we wrap up here today, uh, you know, what's your, your vision? I know you're wanting to, your plan is to work and coach people uh, living with, uh, I'm assuming multiple sclerosis, but maybe you have, uh, you know, so maybe you could just share a little bit about your vision as you, as you step into uh, 2020 
and um, and then we'll just wrap up with some last words. Yes, I just, I just wanted to say that what you just said is very profound, Jen. So yes, it doesn't cost anything to breathe. All that we need is the longing, the willingness. That that's all we need. Mm -hmm. Just to breathe, we can look at ourselves, for example. And I love how you say dating myself, having dates with myself. So I love that. This is so beautiful. I love it. Oh. So, okay, fine. Yeah. My vision. Yeah. Of course, I want to share this book I wrote to give hope to people, to give them inspiration, to give them another way to look at life. So this, of course, is very dear to my heart. And then, since I gotten over the fact that my old career is dead, I, I had all the time to bear it, it's really dead. But I have a new career that I can open up to. And now it's time for me to open up to this new part of my life, this new chapter of my life. I'm gonna dedicate some time to doing this, creating a new life. And when you say doing this, maybe you can be a little more specific. I want to coach people. I want to be a, a coach. I want to be coach to people. So I'll be, I will be reaching out to people. Yes. So how can people find you? They can. Where can they buy your, your book, Munina? It's on Amazon. It's also on my website. Okay. And your website is what? What is your website address? My name, MuninaBunaAli.com. Okay. And there you can find what I'm, I am coaching about. I'm a life master consultant. So I am a transformational law life coach because, of course, after this journey, transformation is my passion. So I want to give those tools that I have done. I want to share those tools with other people that want to transform themselves, that have this longing. It all starts with the longing. If you don't have the longing, it's fine. If you do, I can help you. Right. So transformational life coach. Yeah. And they can find you at Munina Buna Ali. And the and we'll put the name, they'll see your name in the description below. Thank you. So they'll see that there. Um, also, I just want to invite people to, uh, if you enjoyed this interview, this is the first one from the Leading Change with MS to, to, to comment below, like, and subscribe to the um, Women Thriving with MS channel. Also, uh, yeah, so Munina has her website. And I just want to say, I, 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 hopefully we'll, we'll get it to do this again uh, uh, down the road. I, I'm just, it's such an honor, Munina, to have you. I picked you as the first person to be part of this new series because I just, I love your message. Uh, you know, just your human, as a human being, you're an uh, incredibly beautiful person, and I feel honored to be getting to know you. And I think uh, we, you and I as uh, can cheer each other on. And um, and so uh, I encourage you to check out Munina's website, buy her book if you're interested, and check out what she can offer you in terms of uh, transformational coaching. Uh, last words from you, Munina, before we, we just do the wave and say goodbye. Yes, it was a pleasure to talk to you, Jen. And I'm so honored to have had this opportunity. But I'm taking with me words you said about dating myself. I, I want to put this in my calendar, in my big to-do list of the week. Every week I can have a day with myself, like a, a formal date. I can put it on my calendar. That'd be amazing. So fantastic. So what would be your one of your what would be one thing that you'd like to put on your calendar as a date? What would that be for you? Good question. There are so many things. What comes to mind is uh, taking a bath, taking a walk. That, that those are ideas. Yeah. But there are so many. We'll see. Yeah. And, but and to have this on my calendar. That'd be cute. A day. Right. Yeah, because it's that commitment that you're yeah. making. That's yeah. what you're saying here, right? I think it's is nice. yeah. Making that 
commitment to ourselves. And I think that that is really a great way to wrap up is that self-love is about making a commitment to ourselves in ways to nurture and love ourselves and to be in whatever way that can, whether it be you put a notification in your phone or you put post-it notes up on your wall or you send yourself an email or you, you know, uh, can I tell you one funny story? <laughs> um, so <clears throat> when I, um, when I left a, a long-term relationship, one of the things I noticed, it was around the time that, you know, I had my business, but I, the phone wasn't ringing, you know, I didn't have any calls. I don't know. I was feeling very lonely. I moved out. I was living by myself and um, I used to leave myself voice messages Hi, Jen, just calling to say hi, you know, it's so nice to, I'm looking forward to talking to you and I uh, just want to tell you how much I appreciate you. And then I'd go home and I'd see that the, my phone was flashing because that's back in the days when I had just a regular phone and a cell phone. And I'd be like, oh, somebody left me a message. I'd forgotten <laughs> <laughs> that I left that message for myself, right? But it was like a way that I was able to really gift to myself didn't cost me anything but a minute of my time and the gift of it was so wonderful and i think um just inviting all of you who are are, are listening to this uh to this conversation that we're having and and being a part of it is find that way that's going to work for you there are absolute this guy is is open with uh, unlimited ways for you to give and show self-love to yourself. And if you can just start with one thing and consistently try and do something, even if you just start with it once a week and then you do something twice a week or three times, you know, just, just the beginning of it, right? Just getting started. So imagine what that could be for you. Imagine um, where you're going to be doing it and what you're going to be doing it. Where, where you gonna be in a certain room? Are you gonna be in the bathroom looking at the mirror? Are you going to be laying on your bed doing breath work? You know, what that will be for you and see yourself actually doing it and then decide when you're going to uh, commit and, and just get going. Lovely. All right. So we'll let you go. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Again, comment below, subscribe, like, and we'll see you again for another episode of Leading, Leading Change for MS. And thank you again, Munina, for being here today. It's been a joyous pleasure. Oh.